Hello, everyone. Uh, let's get started. This week, we will talk about energy systems overview. Um, this hope, uh, this picture, uh, which I like uh, very much, I can talk this picture for like a day. And uh, the reason I like it, because it shows the big picture of uh, our energy systems from energy supply to energy demand from different energy technologies, different energy sources to different energy services that we need. And it relates to basically all the topics we will cover in the class. And it also shows the complexity of our energy systems. As you can see on the top, our energy systems is not just uh, the energy is all also about the economic, which drive the demand and the social impact, which will uh, impact how we use energy and how we uh, accept different sources of uh, uh, energy sources. Uh, no need to say the environmental impacts, including the climate impacts of our energy system. That's in the core theme of the class uh, that to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by mid century, right? So, um, all in all, this uh, is a framework of uh, our uh, semester, you can say. Uh, we will come back to this picture again and again to show how we think about energy as a system. Uh, from the uh, beginning of uh, extraction, and uh, treatment of energy resources to the primary energy that we harvest from uh, the natural world. And then different conversion technologies, uh, power plant, uh, PV, refinery, ethanol plants to uh, convert the energy to secondary energy such as gas, electricity, ethanol, uh, kerosene, uh, and through a massive distribution uh, technologies, in, including our electric grid, uh, pipelines, trucks, to the final energy that ready uh, for use. Uh, we talk about the electrification, uh, and that's also why electricity is uh, very important in, in this uh, framework. Then, it goes to the end user. Uh, we have different end use technologies, uh, air conditioning, and it's the extreme heat, uh, and that drives the, why the load is so tight. And other technologies such as furnace, computer, uh, automobile, for different, so, uh, different sectors, uh, industry, uh, building sectors, um, and uh, uh, transport sectors. Those are the main energy consuming sectors. Um, and the end use technologies convert uh, the energy to useful energy. That's the heat, the electricity, or the lightning, the energy service that we really need. And from all this uh, conversion, there will be energy losses. And that's also why uh, energy Efficiency, uh, we will talk more on that as uh, a key theme of the class too. In the end, uh, it's the energy service that we enjoy and that provide uh, the energy service we need to keep our home warm or cool, um, to, to help us for cooking, for washing, for mobility, for all the uh, services that rely on. Uh, electricity. So think about uh, energy system as such a long value chain and also think about energy system embedded in the economy, energy, and environmental uh, triangle systems. Uh, that way will help us to position uh, the topic that we cover in the class. Um, fundamentals, when we talk about energy from the resource versus reserve, uh, these two 
are very key uh, concepts. Uh, reserves are those uh, resources that are uh, economic, uh, extractable at the today's technology and economic uh, level. And uh, resources are those we know uh, exist. Uh, no. Some are not, not economic, uh, some are sub-economic as you can see here. And this can, these terms can convert to each other as we um, developed higher technologies. Uh, shale gas is a perfect example. When, before we have the horizontal drilling and uh, the hydraulic fracking, uh, it's a resource. Now it becomes a, a reserve that we can harvest and economic. Um, so uh, this is a dynamic term, but um, I try to get a sense of uh, what numbers we are talking about. And you may see uh, numbers that uh, keep changing. Now that's very normal because uh, each year we find a new uh, reserves when new resources becomes reserved and that uh, build up our uh, numbers of uh, uh, the different energy resources we are talking about. Um, also, uh, energy and their conversion are very important. Uh, different forms of energy and uh, what uh, energy we are really talking about. For example, um, mobility, that's kind of a kinetic energy. We, we consume gasoline and convert that to kinetic energy, yeah. And um, hy hydropower, for example, it's a, a gravitational uh, energy and then we convert that to electricity. Uh, so really uh, think about uh, when and where we need such conversion and uh, make usage of the energy embedded uh, in the conversion or the different energy form, and those are very important. Uh, and that's also why the electric uh, energy is so central in our um, daily life because it collects to models, so it can convert to a kinetic energy. It can um, using resistors, so it provides the summer, or it can use uh, convert through the heat pump that. Uh, we can use for cooling or heating. And it can also uh, convert to chemical energy through the electrolysis uh, uh, process that we can convert uh, water to hydrogen, for example. Um, try to get us familiar with the different energy form and the con conversions between them. Um, to give a sense of the uh, global energy flow, uh, when we talk about energy, we always need to be clear about what energy supply we are talking about or what energy uh, demand we are talking about and the conversion or energy flow between them. And uh, the width of uh, uh, how, how big the lines are uh, shows uh, how big share of the energy is in this figure. So as you can see here from top, oil, coal, gas, fossil fuel still provides um, main part of our energy from the primary energy and uh, renewables are increasingly catching up and uh, each stage, as you can see here, uh, it has uh, uh, energy losses and that's uh, uh, unfortunately uh, the reality and any improvement in the energy efficiency or conversion uh, technologies will help uh, address the energy issue. And uh, refinery and power station to uh, convert um, all different forms of prior energy to uh, uh, electricity and then those energy flow through uh, to uh, industry transport, um, and building sectors, uh, that's uh, how our energy uh, flow. And uh, the scale and the scope of the energy flow will shape or reshape how we uh, use energy uh, or how we harvest and, and use energy. Uh, so it's very important uh, for us to get a sense of the energy flow and how it 
evolving over time. And uh, in uh, pay, also pay attention to the units. Uh, here, uh, the global energy flow uses the million tons of oil equivalent. Sometimes they'll use extra joule. Um, and uh, last time we talked about the energy units. So uh, we need to uh, uh, get uh, familiar with those units too. Uh, this is a chart for the United States, uh, which uh, using uh, quartz, uh, and another uh, energy unit units. And here is uh, the flow shows more clearly uh, the center of the electricity generation, um, as you can uh, see here. And the gray uh, flow, those are the rejected energy or wasted energy through so energy losses. Uh, efficiency losses um, and electricity generation is a big portion. So as you can see here, the average efficiency is about uh, one third in the electricity generation using um, uh, fossil fuels and other uh, 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 fuels. Uh, natural gas, a uh, big chunk goes to generate electricity and also used in the residential and commercial building sector. Uh, for heating or for cooking, uh, industry for different industry products. Uh, coal, uh, 90 per, more than 90% now goes to uh, generating electricity and the biomass mostly for industry usage uh, and partial for uh, transport because the uh, mass uh, ethanol through uh, biomass, uh, petroleum, uh, oil mostly goes to transport and the industry. And uh, energy service is um, only a portion of it. And uh, here you can see uh, uh, if you add these two together, it's about 100. And so roughly 30% uh, of the primary energy uh, is, is really harvested uh, for the energy service and then 65 or even more than that. Uh, percent is wasted. That's why energy efficiency is so important. Uh, we will talk this point uh, in more uh, detail later. So here provide a more historic uh, perspective where our energy come from. For a very long time, biomass is dominant energy service. Then we transit to um, coal, and to oil and uh, natural gas. Now, coal, oil, natural gas, each has a big share of our fossil energy use. And increasingly, we have energy from uh, nuclear uh, and new renewables. Uh, this is a little bit out of date, 2008. Over the past uh, two decades, um, uh, renewables really taking off. So if we update this chart to today's level, we would see um, declining of um, uh, coal and uh, expanding of uh, renewables, uh, as you can uh, imagine. And this, uh, like this chart, is, it also uh, shows when our uh, the, the main technology breaks uh, from the steam engine to electric model uh, to more recently the internet revolution uh, and the evolution of the technology also uh, provide a new way to harvest energy and a new um, way to use energy. Uh, those are very, uh, has big implications. Um, the energy usage and uh, it's, uh, our environmental and uh, climate impact. Uh, let's say uh, renewable sources, uh, the uh, more we you can use um, solar PV, wind, and lower carbon energy sources, the better chance we can uh, uh, deal with uh, climate change. End user by sector, um, this uh, breakdown by uh, different uh, sectors. I mentioned transport, industry, and building are the main uh, energy consuming sectors, but uh, no, uh, no. Uh, we also need to mention uh, agriculture uh, has some portion 
and residential is a big part of the uh, formula. This is at the global scale, uh, same. Uh, uh, need updated, but this provides the rough uh, scale and evolution uh, of history of our end use energy by sector. So we have energy supply, we have energy demand, and for the energy system is really or the challenging part is really matching the supply and the demand. Uh, this operates like magic. When you turn on the lights uh, and you flip the switch, the lights is on, right? And we even don't think about where the energy comes from. Uh, when you go to take the bus, the bus operates like magic, right? Go send you to there or you drive your own car, it operates like you when you go to gasoline, you can fuel your tank. Uh, that's what I mean. Operate like a magic. You, you when you go, you can get it right. But on the background, uh, this service or the reliability of a service really rely on massive infrastructure, markets, and the regulations to make it uh, affordable. I say. Uh, the so-called uh, trilemma or in, uh, sometimes impossible triangle. We want affordable, uh, reliable, and an economic, uh, the environmental friendly uh, energy service, um, and which rely on uh, this massive infrastructure, uh, including the electric power systems, the pipeline systems, or the systems that uh, uh, provide the service we need. And the service has to be delivered at the right time, location, and the right price. You go anywhere, you, you need electricity, right? You want to access Wi-Fi, for example, which relies on electricity service. So really need to deliver the service at any time that human need or any place that we need. And also need to meet safety, reliability, and environmental standards. Uh, you probably don't need to worry about uh, when you operate it, right? Uh, uh, fire or electric shock, and those uh, over the history has evolved uh, today's level. Uh, that's benefited from the market, from the regulation. Um, and uh, the service is increasingly disrupted by political economy and climate change, for, uh, uh, as you can uh, see from the news, uh, uh, the Ukraine-Russia uh, war and uh, the extreme heat uh, can disrupt the service, can increase the demand and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the cold weather uh, can really disrupt uh, the supply of gas and uh, create a blackout in Texas, for example. Many people, it has consequences. Many people died uh, in that uh, extreme weather and uh, the loss of uh, uh, access to uh, electricity. So the solution, um, are very often location and temporal based. That means different places have different resource endowment and uh, they may have different uh, energy demand. Uh, for, for example, uh, for cooling purpose, for heating purpose, for both for, for different uh, uh, energy uses with different requirements. In the cold, extreme cold place, you might need uh, uh, service that, uh, reliable service that can endure such cold temperature. Um, uh, vice versa in uh, hot uh, weather uh, uh, locations. Um, as I uh, emphasized, uh, the overarching goal is uh, electrify everything and decarbonize. Uh, electricity. Uh, electrify uh, here, where are we now? 
uh, world average, we are about 20% of electrification. That means 20% of our electricity, uh, sorry, uh, our energy use is uh, using electricity. Uh, other, we still re uh, use uh, biomass, for example, in developing countries, uh, uh, gasoline, oil products, for example, for our uh, transport or uh, aviation or international uh, uh, cargo. And um, we might use other uh, energy uh, too, uh, uh, natural gas and uh, other uh, forms of energy. So um, we have to electrify our energy service as much as possible and in the projections I shared and that uh, by 2050, probably 60 to 80% of our uh, energy we have come from electricity. So we still have a long way to go. Uh, electrify everything in the lead zero. Uh, this report uh, by International Energy Agency, as you can see here, uh, different purposes. Uh, cooling, heating, uh, heat pump uh, for uh, that's the how many units we need and how many percentage of energy demand for heating and population uh, without access to electricity. Definitely, we, we need that. all population to have access to electricity. That's so one hundred percent of uh, electricity access. And steel production, electricity share of light industry, uh, electric vehicle uh, by 2050, 100% electric vehicle share uh, in stock. That's in, in, um, in, in the total stock and in vehicle. Um, uh, battery demand for uh, electric vehicle. Uh, so you can see that our transport sector is a little bit hard. But this is happening. Uh, the new sales of uh, um, EV is skyrocketing, and um, you know we we are at the um, tipping point uh, that uh, such transition uh, is accelerating. I mentioned energy efficiency is uh, very important. Um, here is an example, uh, maybe a little bit extreme. But it shows uh, the concept uh, for the basic of en energy service, uh, which is illumination, right, for lightning. And uh, primary energy, this is come from coal, uh, a typical power plant around and 35 percentage uh, efficiency, uh, which means 65 percent of the energy is lost. And then Transmission uh, has another uh, 1.5 point loss and um, distribution, another two point wiring 0.5. Uh, and when the electricity reach the household, uh, it basically uh, only 31% uh, uh, reach the household. And if we use in condensed light bulb, um, that 31, only 10% of the 31 uh, is converted to light radiation. Um, and 90% uh, uh, is wasted heat. Uh, if we use light bulb in condenser. That's also why increasingly we use LED. The first thing I moved to a new place, I changed all my lights to LED. And that uh, reduced the energy loss and the amount of uh, uh, gratitude. Um, uh, so magnitude of a scale uh, reduced to 10% uh, of the uh, energy use uh, if it will use uh, mad box. And uh, again, those radiation, some are used in the lamp shade and some in the idle that when we are not using it, it's still operating, right? The final um, energy service may be just 1% uh, 
of the primary energy in order to provide the service. So any link in this non-value chain, we can reduce energy losses. It's again for our energy and the climate. For example, can we in increase power plant efficiency? Can we reduce the loss during transmission and the distribution? Can we help with the wiring? Can we use more efficient uh, LED? And can we turn off lights when we are not using it? Uh, those including technologies, those including our markets, those including our behavior change. Each pieces can contribute the formula that to improve the energy efficiency and uh, reduce um, the carbon and environmental footprint of our energy systems. Another example of uh, energy efficiency is the comparison between electric efficiency and fossil uh, efficiency. Uh, conventionally, we use uh, fossil energy. Uh, uh, for example, uh, fossil energy to provide it, uh, to generate electricity here using 40% energy efficiency, that's already very high. Um, uh, and uh, gas heating uh, uh, can achieve 85% efficient efficiency and um, into uh, combustion engine uh, on average 25 to 40% efficiency to provide the mobility, right? For renewables, uh, the conversion is uh, more uh, uh, efficient and not, not a necessary thing. There, uh, conversion from sunlight to uh, electricity is 100% efficiency. Uh, it's only because there are less energy loss um, uh, of uh, the electricity itself. And if we use heat pump, uh, it can have an uh, efficiency uh, about 340%, which means that one energy, uh, one unit of energy in, you can get uh, 3.4 uh, unit of energy out. And that's uh, um, great, right? Uh, because um, it's not uh, producing or generating heat or cool, cooling is getting the heat from the ambient environment uh, and move that to uh, the uh, house. So that's why it can achieve high uh, efficiency heat pump. It's definitely a great technology. Uh, and uh, it's also um, uh, including in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act to provide subsidies to help people to install, to buy and install heat pumps. That's exactly why uh, it saves energy and air. An electric motor, uh, EV, that's also why EV is superior uh, in the energy side uh, compared to the internal combustion engines. Um, so while all the different pieces work together, uh, it will help us to address uh, energy efficiency and uh, think about the energy transition. Um, so in order to transit from today's fossil fuel-based energy systems to uh, middle century carbon neutrality, uh, there are uh, technologies, they are milestones that we need to achieve in order to deliver the targets, right? Um, those include uh, expand, significantly expand uh, lower carbon energy sources, uh, solar, wind, uh, nuclear, uh, and uh, improve energy efficiency of the appliances to electrify our transport. And as you can think of it, so by 2050, as you can see here, uh, we need about net zero electric sector. Uh, those are the key milestones by 2040, which means that we need, we need elect, uh, um, to try to get 100% of our electricity from uh, non-fossil uh, or, or zero emission uh, technologies. And uh, there are other uh, sectors like industrial transport that um, 
can still use uh, some fossil fuel, right? And by 2050, almost 70% of the electricity generation globally from uh, solar PV and wind. Uh, that's the, the scare uh, really needed in, in order to make that happen. In New York's case, which I'm uh, very fortunate to uh, testify for the New York State uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, and also serving in the technical advisor group for the scoping plan to achieve uh, this uh, climate leadership and the Community Protection Act. As you can see here, the timeline, uh, they have really set up very ambitious uh, timeline by 2030, and needed to 70% of the electricity from renewable energy. And uh, by 2040, uh, we'll be 100% zero emission uh, electricity. By 2035, have uh, 9 gigawatt of offshore wind. And by 2050, to achieve 85% of reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this is the, today's uh, ambitious, uh, ambitious goals. And uh, it also pay uh, in, uh, attention on uh, the uh, environment and uh, energy justice that 35 to 40% of the benefit from your climate leadership and community protection act investments must flow to disadvantaged community. The Biden administration has a justice 40 initiative. Uh, that means 40% of the benefits of federal government uh, investments must flow to the underserved, uh, underserved communities. Uh, that's the new initiative, which is uh, much needed uh, because uh, the uh, injustice and uh, inequality in the social economic development. In the one example is uh, when we electrify our uh, transport, right? We we need more electricity, and very often uh, the power plants are located in the um, disadvantaged groups, um, and that's create a environmental burden to those communities. While the benefits are enjoyed by those who, people who, who can all, all afford to buy an electric car in the first place, so that's the inequality we are talking about. Uh, it cannot be ignored and we have to address it. That's exactly what uh, uh, this uh, uh, energy justice is all talking about. Um, shale gas revolution uh, mentioned uh, uh, the technology changes and the implications for uh, our energy systems. And uh, as you can see here, since about 2005, when we reach a point that where the new technology can uh, uh, really taking off and bring down the cost and uh, uh, it um, produce more natural gas at the affordable uh, price and the consumption uh, increase and the import also de uh, decreased to the, uh, and by 2021, it's almost uh, zero uh, net import. So uh, US in Syria can have uh, uh, gas independence, right? So that's benefit from the uh, technology we're talking about. But still, gas is a transition fuel. That means it reduced carbon in the short term, but longer term, we still need a, um, zero carbon or, or no, um, no carbon uh, technologies such as wind, uh, solo. And today they are reaching uh, grid parity. So the renewable revolution is really talking about is uh, renewables are achieving uh, grid parity. And that's big. Um, uh, for example, in 2000, uh, 2021, uh, uh, China, which historically put a heavy um, 
subsidies to the new installation and they canceled its subsidies for new projects, uh, which means that for any projects built after 2021, uh, they will have to compete uh, with conventional technology, which they, they already can. Um, uh, that's uh, the uh, 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 cost declining we are talking about. Uh, Offshore wind uh, has uh, reduced about 40% uh, uh, for the solar PV, more than 80% uh, uh, reduction. Now, offshore wind, uh, in, the cost of offshore wind also declined uh, very fast. So the outcome of that is we see uh, growth from renewables, including hydro, wind, solar, and other uh, renewables. They're all expanding very fast. And uh, in the second lecture, um, we talk about uh, also maybe the, the first one we talk about it's so hard to get those things right, right? The, each time the under uh, estimated the expansion. Uh, that's exactly we are here. Uh, we're talking about renewable uh, revolution. We have a, a shale gas revolution now. Uh, we are in the in the midst of a renewable uh, revolution. So those systems uh, uh, structure changes dynamics really bring us back. To, so when we talk about modeling, uh, how we approach this system. So here are some modelers uh, jargon, right? Uh, you have top-down versus uh, bottom-up. Uh, top-down approach where you have population, you have some key social economic indicators, and then you have projections about future energy demand. You may don't fully incorporate the drivers, but those are the key indicators that will help us to do the projection. While a bottom up, we have very much detailed technology, stock, turnover, uh, the inventory of uh, energy using appliances and energy consuming goods. So we can build, add up to the energy and project in the future, we know that the turnover of the different uh, energy consuming appliances, then we can have better future. Supply side, uh, demand side, it's very important when you talk about energy, uh, where you are, you, you, we need to be very clear about it. It's, are we talking about supply side or are we talking about demand side? Because their logic uh, are very different. Supply side focus on the, uh, the different technologies provide uh, lower uh, carbon service. While the demand side, we may talk about energy efficiency uh, and to improve the quality of service. Intensity uh, uh, is a term to describe uh, what service, let's say, energy intensity is the energy consume consumptions per unit of GDP. So in order to generate the same unit of GDP, the less uh, energy cons consumption we have, then the better, right? That's the intensity. And elasticity is a term to describe the change of the different variables. Uh, how big change, uh, if two variables are linked, how big change this step will link to the change of the other one. For example, the change of GDP as versus to the change of energy. That's the elasticity we're talking about. IAM is the integrated assessment model. Uh, that's a model system or a type of model that uh, we uh, very often are discussing is to use the integrated assessment to integrate from the climate model with the economic model, with the uh, energy system model and the carbon emission model. So it's like uh, integrated system to help us, us to understand the relationship between 
energy use, uh, climate impact, and the economic uh, impact. Uh, it's a big community. It has an uh, integrated assessment modeling uh, consortium. It has annual conference. Uh, so that you can check on the resources in, in our uh, class uh, website. So all this has risks and uncertainties. And when we do modeling, we have to pay attention to the risks and uncertainties and to be clear about how we address them and to communicate those uncertainties. This way we can talk with each other about the models. And how modelers think about uh, the energy systems. Um, I, in the very beginning, we talk about uh, modeling for insights for, for the uh, structure relations for, and it's not a specific numbers, it's rather uh, those insights, those building consensus and showing the relations are more important, right? So that means we pay attention to system components, uh, structures and the relationship. Uh, no matter what top down or bottom up models, we, we need to show the logic, the, the structure. Um, for example, in, when we discuss um, the key indicators, uh, population, uh, affluence, uh, and the technology, the so-called APAT function, or we pay attention to the economic sectors, structures, different economic sectors, how they are in relation with uh, the energy consumption. We also pay attention to ladder works, uh, transmission ladder with transport ladder pipeline networks, and that will help us build the, help us to build the, uh, the linkages, right? If we know energy service has to be uh, location and the temporary related, then networks is how those components are interconnected. Uh, if we do optimization, we also need to uh, know their objectives and constraints. Um, and um, for example, if the objective is to minimize the cost, then uh, it's, a, uh, to, it's economic. And the constraints very often is the resource constraints, the environmental emission carbon constraints, and uh, some other technical physical constraints like uh, no, cannot exceed the thermal limits of the transmission lines or the trans transport limit of the pipelines. Those are the important. And uh, if you build a new transmission lines, what's the cost? And is it possible to get the support of local community? Um, and that's bring in the social economic and even culture aspects into the modeling system. Uh, increasingly, and the in integrated assessment model community are discussing if the modeling or if the energy system are political uh, variable. You, is it possible to build out this much of a renewable uh, capacity, for example, or if it's possible to address the employment impact of a uh, uh, co-facing out, for example. So those are the things that really help the modeling community to, to improve. Uh, that's the validation and calibration. When you, we build a model, we'll try to validate it with the historic data, with the real world, if our modeling results make sense. And to calibrate the, the moving different moving pieces so we can improve the model. Uh, when we have results, for example, uh, we, we can, we need to interpret our results and communicate with the policy maker, with the public of the modeling uh, results. So this is um, an overview of our energy systems and how it is related to uh, the modeling community and how we think about uh, these complicated uh, systems. Um, I put here some uh, ex extra readings. Uh, those are very good. 
Uh, it's in beyond of that, I have uh, very detailed links on the source of each of the charts. Some might out of date, but it provide uh, some historic perspective. Uh, once uh, they have updated version, like updated, but that's uh, the uh, the energy primer from uh, uh, Yasa, uh, which is really good uh, uh, resources for uh, because that's part of the global energy assessment report. Uh, I hope that we have a um, have an update uh, and uh, they uh, recommended a reading and posted on um, uh, Bright Space, uh, very good resources, uh, different energy primary by different uh, institutions like the FERC. Um, those are very good resources to you to quickly get an overview of uh, uh, the energy systems or the electric power systems. Uh, okay, I hope you find um, uh, those helpful and um, thank you.